Hi, I'm Ray Cole Jackson, the managing partner of Title Experts. Welcome to this recording of Closed and Funded, the closing process for realtors. This is a brief training where we bring you behind the closing table and give you an opportunity to learn how a transaction moves from contract to closing from the title agent's perspective. If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to us via email at closings at titleexperts.com or dial our corporate office at 561-510-2294. We hope to hear from you soon and see you at the closing table. All right. Good morning, ladies. We actually have a number of people registered, but because I want to be respectful of time, um, I am going to get started. And um, as everyone trickles in, the, the room is open and so everyone will come in at their pace, but I definitely want to be respectful of everyone's time and get started on time. If you know me, if you've ever been in any of my rooms, I start on time. <laughs> so I uh, just want to First of all, say good afternoon. It's officially 12 o'clock, so good afternoon and welcome to today is Thursday. Welcome to Title Experts Closed and Funded, the closing process for Realtors. My name is Ray Cole Jackson. Uh, really quickly. If someone can come off mic really quickly and or off mute rather and confirm that you can see the screen, that would be great. Yes. Uh oh, one second. I am. I have my sound off. Lori, were you confirming for me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly and I can see your screen. I appreciate you. No problem. All right. So, um, as I said, my name is Ray Cole Jackson. Uh, I just a little bit about myself as we get started. I am a real estate attorney, um, originally from Florida. I attended the University of Florida, go Gators, if there's any Seminoles in the room. Um, I obtained my law degree from Santa Clara University, my LLM and real property development from the University of Miami. And I am a licensed real estate salesperson in Florida. Um, I did obtain my real estate license in California as well during my first year of law school. Um, the reason why I kind of give you guys this background is oftentimes um, as attorneys, I, I personally see myself as a realtor attorney <laughs> or attorney realtor. Um, we get a bad name and they're like, oh, they're just going to try and kill the deal. Well, that's not the case. It's certainly for me. Um, like I always tell my realtor colleagues, I was a licensed realtor before I was an attorney. So I completely understand um, the process. I mean, I'm, I'm in it. My husband's a broker. We operate a real estate broker. So the perspective of all of the trainings that I provide come from boots on the ground. I'm right out there with you. I've been out there with you closing deals. And so I always like to give that quick introduction. Um, outside of title experts, like I said, Realty Law Group is our real estate piece. And then Transaction Experts is our transaction coordinator and training arm. So what is title insurance? I, I love having this conversation because I feel that title insurance is one of those elusive, like, what, what is your purpose anyway? <laughs> so title insurance, similar to health insurance, car insurance, life insurance, it is insurance protection for real estate. Um, it is a form of protection that ensures against financial loss from defects and title to real property. So we're insurance agents. Um, we're, we're issuing property insurance. Generally, uh, in most transactions, at the end of the transaction, we are issuing two policies. One is a lender's policy and an owner's policy. Obviously, as the title would indicate, for a lender's policy, that will be required when the, the transaction is being financed, right? Um, the lender's policy, it protects the lender. The, this policy provides no coverage to the homeowner. It is possible, but never not likely at all in a finance transaction to have a lender's policy, but not an owner's policy. Again, it's possible, but it's not likely at all. Uh, generally, that's what's negotiated in your purchase and sale contract. Who is paying for the title insurance? So again, at closing, we're going to issue those two policies, the first being the lender's policy, the second being the owner's policy. The owner's policy protects the homeowner. It is also, again, a form of protection from prior title defects. The lender's policy is going to be, uh, is the, the coverage amount is going to be up to the amount of the loan. 
the owner's policy is going to be up to the purchase price, right? So if it's a $2 million purchase, the owner's policy will be for $2 million. If the owner took out a $200,000 loan, the lender's policy will be for $200,000. Now, what does title insurance covers? First thing to understand is that title insurance covers from the date of closing back, backwards. It covers what may have occurred, whatever title issues may be existing on the property up to the date of closing. It does not cover any issues post-closing. Again, it does not cover any issues post-closing. So if you're, if the homeowner goes out and let's say, for example, they execute a quick claim deed or um, there's a judgment that's recorded against the property after closing, they cannot come back to the title agent and say, hey, you need to address this because insurance, just like car insurance, if there is an issue with their title policy such that they, 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 are, uh, they have a financial loss, they can come back to the title agent to resolve it and be made whole financially. So title insurance covers improper, improper execution of documents. It covers mistakes in recording or indexing legal documents. So um, if a, let's say for example, there's a, a successive chain of deeds that should have been, uh, that were executed and they should have been recorded A to B, B to C, some type of way they're recorded B to C, A to B. That's, that's not proper. Can we make sense of it? Yes, but those should have been recorded in order A to B, B to C. Forgeries and fraud. There have been fraudulent deeds executed and recorded. Um, that is an examination that's done when a title search is run. Our examiners look at the documents and say, mm, so for some reason, this doesn't look like, you know, something looks a little off on this one. And they'll ask for additional information to confirm the, the validity um, of the document. Undisclosed or missing heirs are covered. Again, if there's a, that's, this is in the case if there's a um, death in the chain of title, as we call it. So if there are heirs to the property um, that should have been named, title insurance covers that. Unpaid taxes and assessments, unpaid judgments and liens, those are the most common ones and unreleased mortgages are most common. Uh, so I'm gonna check a couple questions. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie, go Gators. Um, so is it in Francis question is, is uh, title insurance like E&O insurance, errors and omissions? Essentially, yes. If there's any errors and omissions in the in the title agent's work, then yes. So similar to errors and omission in that regard. All right. Not a problem. So the we go into the process and then and this is obviously for you all we have a we have an hour and a half together um it's a overview of the process it's so that you have a good understanding of what the title agent is doing on their side so that you can um help facilitate their process you are you all are often very often needed in this process for whatever reason if someone's not answering the phone they're not cooperating we ask once twice a third time i'm pulling the realtor in <laughs> because i know they want the deal closed so again this is to let you guys know what's going on um, in the title agent's office and what are they doing to get your deal to the closing table so the first thing is intake and onboarding um, that process is pretty pretty uh, basic is not very heavy. At that point, we're getting the buyer and the seller's names. We're getting the social security numbers of parties. We're getting the address and phone numbers, and we are definitely needing your information as well. Um, this information can be collected a number of ways. Um, our office, for example, we use an a, um, electronic request. So information searches go out electronically. You're able to type that information in and send it back. Um, some title agents will use documents. You know, they're still sending you the form to be completed and returned. Um, with, the, with these tools now, there's an efficient way to get that information back. And so 
again, if you, I'm sure many of you have worked with different title agents, and so some will, some may have information requests sent the way that we do electronically. Some may still ask for documents to be completed in return. What's most important at the end of the day is to make sure that you get that information back as soon as possible. Here are some issues that we have, and you might not think about it. Um, if the realtor generally, obviously whoever represents the party that selects a title agent, they're gonna send that email in, right? So yes, we have your phone number, we have your email address, um, but if you don't, if you don't have a transaction coordinator that has sent us that full information sheet, we don't always have the contact information for the cooperating agents, right? So the buyer's agent or whomever it may be. And so for us, we'll sometimes do a quick Google search, but our information request does ask for that information. Likewise, your buyer and your seller, we may have their names, but we might not have an email address or a phone number. And so that's where time is of the essence and making sure that those requests are responded to um, as soon as possible. The next step is obviously the um, escrow and earnest money deposit is needed. Generally, the earnest money deposit can be made by personal check, cashier's check, or bank wire. Notice cash is not there. <laughs> um, that's just not the best way to make an earnest money deposit. I'm not saying that no one's ever going to accept it, but these are the most um, appropriate ways for your clients to make an escrow um, earnest money deposit. Now, want to make sure to highlight a point here concerning wire fraud. Wire fraud is still rampant. It is still going on. It is still something to be highly cautious and careful of. So wire fraud occurs when an individual receives and follows fraudulent wire instructions. These fraudulent wire instructions are usually sent via email, but they can be delivered by any means. What does that mean, Raycole? That means um, you understand that generally the method by which a uh, hackster, as we call them, they communicate, they will hack your email and they will sit and they will watch, right? And so if they have access to an email address, most generally they have access to a phone number, they have access to a physical address. So they could pick up the phone, they could send a text, they could mail out letters. Now, has that happened before? I think someone was text before. But here, what, here's what I'm saying to you. You cannot count it out, right? What you are trying, what we're trying to prevent is information being delivered to the prospect, to the buyer, right? So, or fraudulent wire instructions being delivered to the buyer. Now, what, I, what, I, what I've added here and I, what I want to be sure um, that you guys key in on is the last part of the slide where it says, do not deliver wire instructions on behalf of the title agent. I'm missing the the, but on behalf of title agent, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not. Guess why? Because in the event of an attempted wire fraud or a successful wire fraud, you don't ever want to think that it could have possibly been, been because of your communication with your client. What do I mean by that? If you start off sending wire instructions, from the type from your title agent and then the hacker creates an email address impersonating you sending wire instructions to your client well your client took wire instructions from you before why wouldn't they trust this email now you see how that happens so you don't want any any confusion as to whether or not your client should accept wire instructions from an email from you um, additionally, it would make sense, and I do suggest that you have in your signature block, the same way that title agents have in their signature block, beware of wire fraud. You should have a beware of wire fraud um, disclosure or notice, including the language. You will never receive wire instructions from me. If you ever receive an email saying that they're from me, saying that it's wire instructions, you need to immediately contact the title agent. Also call me immediately by phone to confirm, right? If you do not have that in your in your signature block, your, your professional real estate signature block, I suggest that you add that. Now, after the um, escrow um, has been collected, generally the title agent is gonna start ordering searches. We're gonna order 
Um, we're going to order a title search, we're going to order a lien search, and we're also going to order surveys and an estoppel if it's relevant to the property. Now, the title commitment. A title search is, is used to review the property's history of documents recorded in the public records. This is what a title search is. We go into the public records and review everything that's recorded against the property. The title commitment is the result of that search and it indicates title issues to be resolved in order to issue title insurance at closing. So this is just a quick uh, screen capture of what the Schedule A of a title commitment looks like. Now in our office, every document that comes in as you know from the search, and I'm pretty sure most, most title agents do this, this is not anything I don't think that's exclusive to our office, but I'll tell you for sure, um, because we have a policy of full transparency, any searches that are ordered, they're gonna come to you. And as a realtor, you want to receive these documents. And this is the entire purpose for having this sort of review of the closing process. Because I expect my, and I, I encourage my real estate professionals to understand the information that's being shared with you. You don't have to be an expert, but at least be familiar enough to have a conversation and notate, um, know where to find the answer. So Schedule A is gonna be one of the first pages of the title commitment that you see. Just to go over it really quickly, the Schedule A is um, the first line is the title commitment date. It's just saying that this is the this information is good as of this date and time, right? So we ran a search, we got the search back on January 28th. And so this is what we found in reference to this property as of this date. Now you see here policy to be issued. We see a, an alter owner's policy and a loan policy. Remember we talked about, so this is a finance transaction. There's gonna be an owner's policy issued to um, the owners for 265 and they're gonna get a loan policy for 274,540. Now, what are you saying here? This is a VA loan. So they got more than the purchase price. There was cash back on this loan. You also see here, it says title to the estate or interest in the land um, is vested in. This, this section tells us who is shown as the current owner of the property. This is all in your Schedule A. Here in this section, it's gonna tell you the legal description. If you've ever sat in a, um, one of my purchase and sale contract review classes, you hear me say that on the first page of the uh, far bar as is contract, it is important that you have the property address correct. However, in title, we go based on the legal description. That's what's most important. The, uh, the property address, we, we call that also known as, but when documents are recorded, they're not recorded against 123 Main Street. They're recorded against lot two, block three, you know, according to the public records of, <laughs> we go by all of that. And so again, you wanna get your, your property address correct but it's not gonna, it's not fatal for our purposes because we go by that very long legal description and not even the one that you see on the property appraisers page because that's the short form. And then you're gonna see that the, um, the title commitment is signed. So that's my John Hancock there. Now, schedule B1 of the title commitment is what we call the requirement. Remember I talked about the title search, research is a document, the title, the title commitment is, here are all the things you must do. And so you see it even says here specifically, all of the following requirements must be met. And it goes on with a long list of all the requirements that we must meet in order to issue a insurance policy at closing. Now, you as a realtor, when you get this back, a couple, you wanna look at this. So here's some things that would jump out to me. You see here at line item requirement number eight says there's a notice of commencement recorded. That means that there was some work done on this property that needs a contractor's release. Here at requirement seven, record a release of summary memorandum. This is a PACE loan. You guys are maybe familiar with those. Those are um, the loans that are given to um, bring the property, make some energy efficient repairs to the property. Um, the loan does require a uh, lien be recorded against the property. This is important for your buyer. Pace loans were a big issue at a, at a certain time because we were not able to easily identify that a property had a pace lien on it, but now they, they're, they're better about um, disclosing that. Here it says recorded satisfaction of mortgage. That means we know that this property has a mortgage on it that needs to be uh, released. 
it tells us who to that the D needs to come from Sandra Seller. It says that it needs to be uh, she must be joined by her spouse in signing this deed if she's married. And if she is married, um, but the spouse is not signing, she needs to say that it's her non homestead property. It has to be her, her non homestead property, right? So you guys don't have to get into the weeds of all of these requirements, but it's good for you to put your eyes on it to see what the title agent is addressing. Why? If something looks funky, you might know that you. Th this is a title issue that may take a little bit more time to resolve. Case in point, we had a closing. Um, and it, this doesn't happen, this is not completely uncommon, but recently there was a closing on a commercial property. It was calling for a satisfaction of a mortgage from 1989. And the buyers purchased the property in, you know, 95 and they're like 89. <laughs> I didn't even own the property. Why is there still a mortgage on this property from 89? And also it indicated parties, names that were not parties to the transaction. For me as a realtor, I'm saying, who is Janie Sue? Janie Sue is not even a, not a buyer or a seller or, you know? So you will watch that. Now, generally the title agent will come back and say, hey, listen, there's a unresolved mortgage on this property. Remember we talked about earlier, those are some of the things that are resolved. And so you might want to keep an eye out for those types of things. Again, this is not for you guys to try and get into the weeds or clearing out title issues, but so you know, this is what the title commitment is, <laughs> right? Um, in addition to the title commitment, we also do the lien and open permit search. The lien and open permit search, they look at utility liens, they look at... Um, code violation liens. It also looks at open permits. Now you guys know um, that the most recent FARVAR contract uh, does not require that the seller close out open permits. So now a lot of you will have in your uh, additional terms as standard language that the seller agrees to close out open permits. You know the other reason why that's important? Open permits are not title issues. They are not. We will um, hold off on the closing if there's an open permit. If the parties have clearly agreed in the far bar as is contract for, to have open permits closed out. But without that language, if an open permit is reflected on the lien search, we will advise the parties. We will have a, um, a uh, hold harmless executed as to holding us harmless. Buyers acknowledging there is, they are aware that there is an open permit on the property. However, it has, and it has not been closed out. There is no title insurance coverage for that. On your screen, you see a, a, squick, uh, a, squick, <laughs> a quick screen capture of um, a portion of a lien search. Now, if you have never seen a lien search before, here's some of the areas of it is saying that the, I, I like this particular lien search because as you can see, it's color coded. And so as, as if you lay your eyes on it quickly, you can easily see the green says that these sections are okay. The red says you need to address these sections, right? So here is saying that the taxes, the property taxes are due and current, that there are no delinquent taxes, that there are no personal taxes, um, no personal tax information. Um, this is common. Water utilities, this is common. Now, if this number is 51,000, we're that's a conversation to be had, but generally there's always going to be a water bill, right? So that's also the purpose for an escrow holdback uh, for water because it's always accruing. And so um, you're always going to see, generally always going to see an amount for the water and that's fine. Here is waste, waste, and then assessments. This is, I'll go ahead and point this out. This area here is for public assessments, all right? This is similar to, so this is in your in your far bar as is contract in the section where it says um, who's responsible for special assessments, not HOA assessments. Those are different. Those are in your, your HOA estoppels. This is public assessments. Um, and so this are some of this is this speaks to that. Now this one obviously it's it's clear and it says those are included, any special assessments are included in the tax bill. Now here's the next section of this same lien search. And this is what I wanna point out for you. Code violations, which this shows, yes, those must be closed out prior to closing. 
code violations must be closed out prior to closing. That is a title issue. So you see this says, yes, um, you, we're going to um, want to pull this case, look at the documents and see what the code violations that need to be cleared. Now here in the permit section, it says that there are no open permits. And that's good. See, this is green. And there are no lien letters. All right. So that's a, um, a lien search, lien and open permit search. They're pretty, they're pretty clear and apparent, not hard to read, but it's just understanding what needs to be addressed in those. Again, open permits, if you guys have agreed, if the buyer and seller have agreed that they are to be resolved and they, they are notated, then they will be resolved outside of that. They're not title issues. Code violations are always um, issues that must be resolved. The association estoppel. Obviously, if the property is located in an HOA or condo association, an estoppel will be ordered. The estoppel will let us know uh, the, if there are any violations on the property as it relates to the association's rules and requirements. It will let us know what the maintenance dues are, if they're current, um, if there's any capital contributions, just everything concerning the association, whether or not the buyer needs to make an application, if they must interview, if they've already been approved, everything. <laughs> Parking spaces is essentially an abstract of that uh, property. So just a review of this quick screen uh, capture of this estoppel, you see that this seller had a credit of $3,450 um, of their association dues at the time that we uh, ran this search. One thing I want to point out, the lien search and the estoppel, your title agent is generally going to want those to be within 30 days of closing. So if you have a delay and it pushes you out 45, 60 days, don't be surprised if the title agent wants needs to run a new search or an update. And unfortunately, oftentimes, depending upon the association or the um, public body, they may charge you all over again for another search. So this is why you oftentimes will see title agents uh, wanting to wait for you to get through your inspection period, make sure you're gonna go forward with the transaction or even wait, this is not the climate right now, we're closing quickly right now. But if you have a long closing period, they may not order your estoppel just right away. They wanna give you a little bit of time so that it, so that it is not stale, right? All these things should be within 30 days of closing. Um, the other information that shows is there was the maintenance amount this and this particular property is $1,875 per quarter. The next payment was due July 1st. Uh, there's a late fee of $80 if it was not paid by the 15th. Uh, this property does not have any special assessments. Remember, public assessments, association assessments. So this property um, does not have any association assessments. There's no capital contribution due. There's no equity membership. There's no resale fee. There's no transfer fee. Transfer fees are common. Generally, it's what the association charges to transfer their records from the current owner to the new buyer. It's about a hundred bucks or so. And that is a buyer's fee. Just in case um, you were wondering, that is a fee that is paid by the buyer. And there are no other fees on this one. Now, there is violations on this property. Uh, they needed to clean the roof, remove a hedge, replace a mailbox. Uh, there are weeds in the driveway, and there was debris. So these are, again, this is an example of one of the items that the title agent is reviewing with regards to the HOA estoppel. So now we've seen the, uh, the title search to provide a title commitment. We have the open permit and lien search. The third is the HOA estoppel um, to do a search of the association's uh, requirements concerning the property. And a fourth is the land survey. Do a lot of searches. The land survey is conducted con to confirm the boundary lines of the property and confirm that none of the property structures are over its boundary line. I'm gonna say that again. Make sure that the property and all of its structures, so the pool, the fence, the sidewalk, the outhouse, anything that's, that's part of the property that's being conveyed needs to sit within its boundary lines. Now, I would say 
90% of the properties that I that we close have some encroachments. Um, they're not haven't haven't come across one that was fatal as yet. Knock on wood. <laughs> but you will see, you know, at least oh, you know, the sidewalk encroaches on an FPL easement. Those types of things. Those are not uncommon. When the survey is complete, and this is an example, it's a quick screenshot of um, the top page. I guess the most important page of a of a survey. So we get this back and it shows a layout of the property on the land, the different structures. And then this section here is what's most important, the notes. It comes back with the results and it says, hey, this property, the fence and the shed land in the easement along the north lot line. So I just went back to the full one saying the fence and the shed, right? You see the shed, chain link fence. These red dashes are saying we are in an easement, right? Now what's gonna happen is we're gonna take those, we're gonna take that information, we're gonna make it an exception to coverage. What does that mean? That means you know that this fence buyer You've been made aware that the fence and the shed, they land in the easement. Should the easement holder come and they need you to move the fence and the shed so that they can access the easement, you cannot come back to us title experts and say, we've been damaged, you need to make us whole. No, this is an exception. This is not covered by your insurance policy. All right. So when the survey comes back, this is added as an exception. It's sent to all parties. Again, it's sent to the lender. This exception is also added to the lender's policy. The lender is also advised, like, hey, this property, the fence and the shed lands in the easement. Should there be an issue, we are not responsible. All right. So that's what's called the exceptions to the policy, and that's Schedule C. Moving to the money. So that's we've done all the searches. We've done the title search for the title commitment. We have the lien and the open permit search. We've done the estoppel for the association. We've done the survey. We've, cl we've cleared all of our structural issues. Now, mind you, remember at the, at the same time, the lender is doing an appraisal. So they're, they're examining the property's value. And you guys have already conducted the um, an inspection. So you're looking at the structure to make sure that the the structure itself is sufficient and acceptable. One thing to be mindful of, it is possible that the title agent will never see the physical property. We're not insuring the physical property. We're insuring the title to the property. So um, it could be, you know, halfway to the ground. We're like, okay, but title's clear. It's all yours and <laughs> you won't have any title issues. So keep that in mind. Uh, one question was an easement is what? An easement is the ability to access land. It is a right to use the land for a purpose. You don't own it, but you can access it. So let's say for I tell my, my, my neighbor, you know, my neighbor doesn't own my land, but you have the right to, I'm going to allow you to use the right side of my land to access the lake in the back. You know, so that's what an easement is. Uh, question, Ray Cohen. Can you hear uh -huh. me? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, morning. Um, the the way you explain it, um, I think I I need a more broken down version of how you explain it based on I guess the scenario that that you're talking about. Does that make any sense? Say again. I wanted you to explain the easement in in the scenario that you are talking about it from. So um, I don't know if that makes any sense because the the way you explain it, so I'm guessing that the, the easement is a part where it's, or maybe they're making an exception. Is that what you're talking about? Do I understand? The easement is gonna be an exception to the coverage, meaning if an issue arises concerning the easement, the neither the buyer, the new owner, nor the lender is going to be able to reach out to us and say we've been damaged 
you know, some of the, the, there's an easement on this property that we didn't know about. You do know about it. We told you from the survey, we told you that you're not covered. So if the easement holder comes and they want to access the property, but this fence and this shed is impeding their access to the easement, then that's going to be a discussion to be had. Okay. This is not something that happens all the time. There's a ton of easements. There's FPL easements. There's water easements. Those are, there's there's a ton of like underground easements. The the surveyor just simply must notify the parties that they're there. What you would be most concerned about is, let's say, for example, your pool lays over your boundary line. Now that's not easily movable. You can move a fence back. A pool, not so much. House, not so much. So, but those small items, they're very common. All right. Um, once we've gotten through the searches, we are addressing the settlement statements. Now, in a finance transaction, you're going to have what's called a closing disclosure. It has federal regulations uh, with regards to how the closing costs are disclosed in that document, closing disclosure. You're also going to have what's called an ALTA settlement statement. We used to call it a HUD-1 called an ALTA settlement statement. They're the same, and I'm gonna, don't get dizzy, I'm gonna flip back and forth. It's the same closing cost. It's just on a different form. I personally like the ALTA because <laughs> you get to see um, the cost comparisons, buy or sell it on one document versus all on one side, but that's just me. Also, the difference between the closing disclosure and the ALTA with relate with relations to um, the title insurance cost is going to be different. The federal requirement, and I'm not going to make you dizzy, but just understand that the federal requirement when a transaction has both an owner's policy and a lender's policy, it requires that the total amount of funds that are being allocated towards insurance policies that the, that the full amount of the payment for the lender's policy is reflected on the, on the closing disclosure first, right? So in this section, you're gonna see, whereas the lender's policy is really only, you know, it's a small amount, because federal law requires that the full amount be shown as paid, and then as there's actually a credit at the bottom to, e to even it out, um, it's reflected that way. But on the all to settlement statement, the insurance is the actual amount. Now, these are two different transactions, so don't try and compare on this one. Um, and I use this uh, different transaction because of, because of some fees, not in the other. We can receive either three days before closing to review the buyer, correct? You should. <laughs> That's a different conversation. Um, but you can actually, not just three days before, you should be receiving this, these, at least the ALTA, not the closing disclosure, but you should be receiving the ALTA regularly throughout the closing process. For example, in our office, when anything that comes in that, that affects how the fees are, um, that affects the fees on a settlement statement, it's going out. So the lien search comes back in. We know the, what you get, what you get initially when the, when you get a, a closing cost estimate, you're going to get an estimated cost of the lien search. You're going to get an estimated cost of the estoppel. Um, but when these lien search comes back, that amount is updated to what the actual cost is. That was, those are pass throughs. We won't know what that cost is until we get it back from the city. Every city municipality, they charge a different amount to provide that information back, right? So that amount will be updated. If there's a balance on the water bill, that amount will be updated. If there are some assessments or fees to be paid to the city, th that amount will be updated. So you get my point that you you should continuously be getting the settlement statement. Um, if you're not, feel free to reach out and ask for it. You know, if you haven't seen a settlement statement in a couple weeks, you know, in a week or so, two weeks, ask your ask the closing agent to send you one. Also, with the estoppel, once that comes back in, um, each association they charge different amounts, and so. The actual amount of the association estoppel will be updated as well as the proration of the uh, association dues are going to be added to the settlement statement. So for that reason as well, once the estoppel goes, comes in and it goes out to the parties, along with that estoppel should come 
an updated settlement statement so that you can see how the figures have changed? That's a good question, James. Um, and then with regards to the three days before closing, yes, that's a federal requirement concerning the closing disclosure. So you should receive it. Now, calculating closing costs and prorations. This is sometimes tricky. What are prorations? Prorations are allocations of costs based on the days, number of days of ownership, right? So you see here, use this as an example. You're gonna always see, you're gonna see taxes prorated on your settlement statement, and you're gonna see association dues uh, prorated if applicable, right? So Avalorum taxes in Florida are value taxes. What is the value of the property, right? We know that Avalorum taxes, they are paid in arrears. This is something that you should understand. Avalorum taxes are paid in arrears, right? So they are, they're calculated from January 1 to December 31st. And the, they're paid in arrears, meaning they're paid after they have been approved. So what happens is once you get to closing, let's say we close on uh, the closing date was, oh, this one's June 19th. So we close on June 19th. The seller is charged in this transaction, the seller was charged $9,663.42 for their time of ownership. It's going to be the full, the annual tax bill divided by 365. And it's going to be the each party's number of days of ownership multiplied by that by that uh, dividend, right? So nine. So the, in this particular case, again at closing, because taxes haven't been paid, they're paid in arrears. On June nineteenth, the seller had accrued nine thousand six hundred and sixty three dollars and forty two cent in tax taxes due. The taxes are not going to be paid until the end of the year. So it's a debit to the seller and it's a credit to the buyer. We're going to take that money from the seller at closing and credit it to the buyer. It's not gonna be actual money coming from, um, it's, it's gonna go to the, the buyer's fund because at the end of the year, they're gonna have to pay those taxes. Non-Avalorum taxes, those are not value taxes. Non-Avalorum taxes are taxes for public works, for example. Those are calculated from, um, those are in, in advance. So when your taxes are paid uh, each year, you're paying from September to September of the following year, September of this year to September of the following year. So since the seller has paid already for through September of this year, they're getting a credit and the buyer is being charged. So again, think forward for non valorem taxes those taxes through uh, through all the way through next year, you see it says 10 1 2020. This was a uh, 2020 closing. They have been paid. So the buyer is going to be uh, charged for that. And then you see here the association dues. The seller had a credit of 247.20, and the buyer um, is debited 247.20. Now, funny fact for this one, if you guys were paying attention, when we first started, that association dues, um, the association estoppel showed a credit of $3,000, right? It took that long <laughs> for this to close. Guess what? I mean, it's not funny, but to talk about special issues, my seller passed away on Friday and it was supposed to close that Monday on a $1.1 million transaction. So it was a delay and it was delay after delay after delay that literally ate into a 3000 plus um, association credit. So if you've, if you've ever had um, that type of issue, no, you're not alone. It's not something that happens all the time, but it does happen. So you know, on this one, the seller passed away on a Friday for transaction was supposed to close on a Monday. Um, can we still negotiate the cost and proration between the buyer and seller up to close? Absolutely. Everything in the contract is negotiable. Absolutely everything in the purchase and sale contract is negotiable. 
everything. It is written from a place of fairness, of balance. But if, you know, let's say the, the seller says if the buyer is short on funds and the seller pays all the closing costs, all the closing costs, if he agrees to it, he can. Let's say the seller is, is going to be short if they have to pay closing costs and then, it, you know, it'll put them in a negative or, or something. And the buyer says, I'll cover the closing costs. If you agree to it, sure. So everything is negotiable uh, in that contract. Whatever the parties agree to is what will be abided by. So that's a good question as, as well, James. Thank you. So what closing costs are included? The closing costs include your down payment, loan points, loan origination fees, PMI or private mortgage insurance, if that is if it's appropriate or applies to the transaction. It includes the title insurance costs, that is a fee. That's promulgated by statute. That's something to understand. The title insurance cost is not going to change regardless of who you go to. That's by statute. It's the same rate whether you go to ABC title or XYZ title, the title insurance rate. Now, the settlement fees change based on the title agent, but the insurance rate is promulgated. Recording fees should generally be about the same. The property taxes are included and then the cash to close. Now, here's something. What I want to point out here to be sure that um, it's understood is that 90% or maybe more so like 95% of the closing costs come from the lender. The way this process works, when we get, as we move closer to closing, the lender will send us their closing disclosure and we do what's called matching and balancing. So we'll take their fees, we'll take their points, we'll take their origination fees, we'll take their PMI, we'll take their, their taxes that they're asking us to record for, all their loan processing fees, and we drop them into the settlement statement. And so understand that um, the 95% of those costs <laughs> don't come from title. And so unfortunately, uh, what was the, James asked the question about the three days before? Yeah, we wish, we, we hope, we try our best because Usually when that settlement statement comes out of the very end and then the buyer has sticker shock, they always turn the title like, why'd you do this? Well, we just took the numbers that were given to us. And so you as a realtor, I'm so glad you asked that question. Push the lenders to keep the buyers in the loop. It is a very hard thing to have buyers that get to closing and they have sticker shock. They're not prepared for the cash to close and they're scrambling. So be active in that process, stay in communication, ask for the closing disclosure yourself so that you can ensure that your clients are not, again, like I said, sticker shop as it gets to closing. Uh, what is the rule of thumb for calculating taxes and insurance for escrows? I need a little bit of clarity on that. Dave, if you can unmute yourself. I mean, uh, how many months taxes and insurance on a regular basis? That's a good question. That's lender specific. Uh, generally, they're going to do three months, but I've seen I've seen lenders collect for a whole year or six months. But generally, most times, I would say up to about seventy five percent of the time, it's three months for taxes um, and insurance escrows. Uh, Franz, you have a question? Yeah, hey, um, I thought that the uh, down payment was like separate from the closing cost. You thought that the down payment was? Separate from closing costs, separate. That's something that, you know, once once the your buyer is in the property, you, you, you draft your file by contract. And uh, once you draft a contract, then you submit the down payment for earnest money. And then, you know, after appraisal, after inspection, then you see what the buyer should bring to closing costs. That makes any sense. You're kind of cutting out a little bit from some of it, some of what you're saying is coming in and out. Um, this is just all the closing costs that's included, not necessarily the, the timing of it, right? So I, I did hear the last part you were saying after some different processes in the, um, some different steps in the processes have been completed. 
then an amount is calculated. That is true. This is just all of them, not irregardless of the time of when they come in. Okay. Um, I wanted to include this for you guys. On our website, we have a closing cost calculator. This is helpful not just for, um, it's helpful for everything. It's funny as I think about it. I mean, this, it has a, um, you can do a seller net sheet if, as you're preparing for, to make a, a listing presentation. It will, it can do buyer closing cost estimates. If you have, if you have multiple offers, you can, you can compare um, the different offers on this closing cost app and determine what, where your seller is going to net the most from based on the offers. Also with that app, you can do the cost of renting versus buying for buyers. Um, so it's a great app for you to, it's actually web-based, we call it an app, but it's web-based, the machine of it, um, it, it will go from your website, but it's on our, if you go on our website and you select ex, uh, expert estimates, it'll take you to a site where you can register, make that link, the link to the calculator, just save it to your desktop or save it to your phone um, screen. And literally we, our realtor partners are just running estimates so that they, you know, in preparation for their uh, listing appointments, as well as buyer consultations, et cetera. So again, on our website, titleexperts.com, and you go to expert estimates for access to that calculator. Um, so in reviewing the settlement statement, and James asked this question, very well put. Review the settlement statement. Prior to closing day, you want to be sure that you review the settlement statement to ensure that all the figures on the settlement statement are correct. This includes the loan interest rate. I've had realtors that are like, oh no, like we never <laughs> agree for that interest rate to, you know, for it to be that interest rate or that interest rate should be better. Um, credits, right? What if you, you discuss a uh, seller's closing cost credit that's not on the settlement statement and you figure out, oh, we never sent the addendum. Um, or maybe it was somewhere buried in the contract and the title agent missed it. I mean, again, that's why we have so many different eyes on the transaction. Some credits or fee, maybe your transaction fee. Sometimes the transaction fee is um, within the body of section, is that nine? Um, with the different costs, closing costs. Sometimes it's in the additional terms. Um, I've had a warranty included and uh i guess the listing agent didn't catch that it was written in on the offer except the offer and they're like what is this 349 for a home warranty and then we go it's the 349 for the home warranty that you agreed to so um just when you're getting the settlement statements go through it line by line and make sure again that everything that that you expected to be there is there and nothing that you did not expect to be there is there and most importantly, make sure your commission is correct. All right, you don't want to miss that one. <laughs> now, I'm going to quickly go over some special issues during closing that could arise. This is actually a separate training just because they can go very in depth. But this is why we took this, this training just to, uh, made it an hour and a half instead of an hour so that we can at least discuss it and you guys are familiar with it. There is an entirely separate training on these special issues during closing. Um, the first one is FERPTA, Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. Us being in South Florida, that is a very common topic. What is that? That is when your seller um, does not have a U.S. social security number or a tax ID. Um, so that taxes can be reported to the IRS. That's simple, simply put, that's what they're most concerned about. And so with FERPTA, there are some exceptions to that, but generally if the seller does not have a, a social security number or tax ID number, the title agent is going to have to withhold 15% of the purchase price, not the proceeds, the purchase price not the proceeds, they're gonna take 15% of the purchase price and um, remit it is the word, remit it to the IRS. Again, there are exceptions, most commonly being if the purchase price is $300,000 or less and the buyer is an individual that intends to utilize the property as their primary residence, the buyer or their close family members intend to use the property as their primary residence for at least six months 
of the upcoming two consecutive years, then there's an exception. The buyer will sign an affidavit affirming that that's going to be their use, and then we will not be required to remit those funds to the IRS. But outside of that, 15% of the purchase price is going to be uh, remitted to the IRS. Here's a quick tw uh, twist for you. What if you have two owners, two sellers? One does have a social security number, the other one doesn't. We'll take half of it, send half 15% of uh, what's that, whatever is half of the purchase price of the IRS, and the other seller is not subject to FERPTA. One thing, one last point to be clear on that uh, the buyer has to be an individual. Because what an entity cannot have a primary residence, right? <laughs> so if you are, um, if you're working with sellers, you know they're subject to FERPTA. That may be a consideration when you're when you're looking at accepting offers, right? Looking at you only accept offers from buyers that is going to allow your sellers to um, to take advantage of the exception. You know, maybe you're like, mm, it has to be, it cannot be an investor, it cannot be someone who's purchasing in the name of the LLC, it has to be an individual because my seller is not interested in um, having to remit 15% of the purchase price to the IRS. 1031 exchange, uh, you may be aware that that is when the, um, the proceeds of the sale of a property is used to purchase the next property. So you're not having to pay taxes on gain. Um, some people call it kicking the can, right? Kicking the can of, of tax payment. And so 1031 exchange is um, closings that we do here in our office. We do use an intermediary or what's called an exchange or. Um, there's a number of documents that must be executed um, with regards to 1031 exchange to ensure that it's facilitated properly. So if, you, if your seller, for example, um, is looking to participate in a 1031 exchange, that's something that you want to get started immediately. Um, it's not your responsibility, but know enough about it to educate your seller because they're going to need to identify their next property. That money can't be held indefinitely. They have to identify their next property and close on the, that next property within a certain time period in order to um, participate in that, um, that tax relief. Rental properties have their own special considerations. We need an estoppel. Um, we need a copy of leases. We need to make sure that we do a credit and debit for any uh, security amounts that were collected, those types of issues. Open permits we talked about earlier. Again, not a title issue, but they need to be resolved, right? If the parties have agreed to it. Escrow holdbacks, those often go hand in hand with open permits. Um, maybe the, the parties would like to close. They are, they are uh, essentially assured that the open permit is not going to be an issue to close, but it's not going to be resolved by closing by closing date. Um, they may ask the title agent to do a holdback, let's say $5,000, to ensure that um, any cost associated with closing out the open permit can be covered, right? And then we do a holdback agreement. Spousal joinder on the mortgage. Remember, I, I read the, um, the requirement at the beginning of the discussion uh, where it mentioned um, Sandra Seller joined by her spouse if married. In Florida, we have what's called a homestead right. Spousal joinder is a discussion on the buy side and the sale side at closing. If a buyer is married and they are purchasing um, a property in their individual name, so not an investment, pro not a property um, in the name of an entity, if they are married and they are purchasing the property in their individual name, their spouse must join in signing the mortgage. We also get situations that say, oh, they're separated. They're going to a divorce. Their spouse must sign um, the mortgage because their homestead interest, uh, the mortgage will create a lien on their homestead interest. In Florida, we get the ability to, um, we get the ability to exercise the homestead exemption, right? And coverage such that if they, we have a legal action, you can't sell my homestead. You can't sell my home. You sell everything else. You sell the boat. You can sell the, you know, you can put a judgment on everything else, but you cannot force sell my homestead property. And so uh, spousal joinder, you, but unless you agree to lien that property and lien my homestead interest, and that's how the mortgage, uh, that's why the mortgage is executed to provide that, uh, that lien interest on the homestead. And so we're, we, we're always looking for the spouse to sign the mortgage. 
Additionally, we're always looking for the spouse to sign um, the deed on, on the sale transaction. Now, I have had uh, lenders who, you know, they were okay with an individual um, proceeding with the transaction without their spouse signing. Um, but we had to put all type of disclosures on the mortgage as well as documents executed. Um, most underwriters positions is this, position, their position is this. Today, you say it's your investment property. Tomorrow, it could be your homestead, right? So their position is that the, the, the purpose of the property can change instantaneously. And now all of a sudden, we're having a conversation about you having not signed the mortgage to create a lien interest on your homestead property. It doesn't take anything other than you just declaring, making a decision, it's not my homestead property. So for that reason, again, it's pretty much across the board. We're looking for spouses to sign mortgages. We're looking for spouses to sign deeds unless it is a, again, non-homestead property. The seller will need to identify, well, what is your homestead property? And we place that on the deed affirming um, that this is not the seller's homestead property. Other Special considerations, and this was obviously it's, it's a, still an issue and it's very hot during the height of COVID, um, is the online notarization and then seller mail away versus, um, or seller mail away versus remote online notarization. Here's the difference. Seller mail away is the physical documents being executed by the seller at a different location than the title agent. It could be right around the corner, right? They could be you know, we're in Palm Beach, they could be in Broward or, or Dade. So it doesn't have to be across the world, but you're just mailing those documents back, right, to the title agent versus remote online notarization. This is hugely different from DocuSign. <laughs> One time I got a request for DocuSign, I'm like, oh, that is, this is not DocuSign. This is way different from DocuSign. Um, remote online notarization, honestly, is a last resort um, just because of the formalities and, uh, and legalities and the requirements, the technical requirements that must be ensured for a successful remote online notarization. What does that mean, Rachel? That means your seller must be technologically savvy or whoever your signer is. Sometimes people, you know, we take it for granted, but everyone doesn't know how to get in front of a camera, make sure the camera is clear, make sure that they have voice, audio, and all that must happen. Secondly, in order to participate in remote online organization, there is a section of the prep that's called knowledge-based questions. What does that mean? The same way, you know, you get your, you do a credit report or you, um, something financial and they say, okay, well, where did you live in 1998? And which one of these cars did you not own? And who's not a member of your family? The knowledge-based questions are based on your US credit history. And so if your sign or does not have US-based credit history, then they won't be able to participate in the knowledge-based um, quiz. So therein where you have a foreign seller who's never had U.S. credit, they're not able to participate in, in remote online notarization. Now, are, there are some, um, some, some cures to this coming around for some special circumstances, for example, using a Virginia notary, et cetera, but, um, but just keep in mind, you know, again, RON, as they call it, the acronym uh, for remote online notarization is not as easy as DocuSign. Um, and it's, it's a last resort for, for uh, execution of documents, especially um, for you know, foreign persons that may not have US credit base history. The last thing is when we do have foreign uh, parties to sign, generally they're gonna go to the embassy or you know, whatever form of notary is local to them in whatever country that they're in. Um, Again, knock on wood, we generally just have not had a ton of issues. Now, I will say this. If you know you have a foreign seller, the best thing to do is to let your title agent know immediately, as soon as the file comes in, so that arrangements can be made to prepare for signing, all right? There's certain documents that can be so deed, the, the, the title documents, the documents that are going to need to be recorded, Let's get those out. Let's get those signed and get those back, even as we work through other property-related issues, right, with the lender, et cetera. 
So again, let your title agent know immediately if you if you sense any type of um, hurdles with your client being able to sign. Now, coming around the bend, closing day. We're not out the woods yet. <laughs> we're literally not out the woods until we're closing funded with keys delivered. Um, you want to encourage your uh, buyer for sure to schedule plenty of time for closing. Now, during the closing appointment, in addition to signing numerous documents, most lenders will require uh, most lenders will require time to review the signed documents. And this review process is called funding approval. They are going to require that all those documents be emailed back, scanned and emailed back to them so that they can review them to confirm that they've been signed properly and that they are satisfied with their signature so that so that the title agent can then release the funds. They can disperse funds. This can take no time and it can take a lot of time. And the worst feeling is to have a buyer that's anxious and just ready to go while we're waiting for a lender to approve their funding docs. So for example, when we do our home buyer workshops, uh, we make sure to include this as a discussion. Be prepared to wait. We have a bunch of snacks in our closing room for this. We got snacks, TVs, crayons, whatever, to make everyone um, comfortable while they wait for the lender's funding approval process. So make sure your clients are prepared for that. Um, cash to close. So immediately before the scheduled closing appointment, the buyer will need to make a final escrow deposit called cash to close. Now, some of you may have the buyer do it. It, it would be best um, for the buyer to make their cash to close deposit the day before closing, not the day of, because some financial institutions, specifically credit unions, remember this, if your buyer um, banks with a credit union, their wires take a little bit of time to process because they go through a couple different layers um, for clearance. And so if you know, you might want to ask if you're with the credit union, go the day before or go as early as possible. Do not attempt to make that wire transfer by a bank transfer. I suggest that you not make it online um, because some lenders they want to see the wire transfer receipt. They want it for funding approval. Um, they'll either want to see the physical document from the buyer or they will want the title agent to show a screenshot of the funds coming into their account. Like they're that specific about making sure that the monies, that all monies have been received. All right. So cash to close is important. Tell them I went until the last minute. Um, again, ask that lender as soon as possible to confirm the cash to close so that there's no sticker shock for your buyers. And then finally, the cash to close must be a wire transfer. It cannot be cash, it cannot be check, and it cannot be a money order. It must be a wire transfer. It has to be funds that hit the account the day of closing or before, right? Um, a check can be um, stop funded, money order cannot clear, all types of issues can occur um, with any other type of, uh, transfers outside of wires. So that'll always be required. So again, um, all this information to share with you guys to make sure um, to provide some clarity for you so that it can be a clear and safe and non-headache <laughs> written um, closing process for all parties involved. It's a team effort. And so um, there's a lot of moving parts. And so we wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page. All right. Questions. Um, closed and funded. Closed means that we've signed. Funded means that the, that the funds have been dispersed. So you get a notification from the title agent. We have closed and funded. We have signed all documents. Funds have been dispersed. Are we getting a PDF of the presentation? Sure, Damien, I can send out a, a PDF for all the registrants. Any other questions? Guys, feel free to come off mic if you like, if you're not scared of your voice. <laughs> and ask your questions, or you can drop them in the chat. Hey, Rico, it's me again. Um, hey. So, yeah, so, so when funds have been dispersed, 
that means that all parties are, were paid and, and so forth, right? Yes. Okay, good. Want to make sure. All right. So my contact information is there. If you have any questions, um, as Damien asked, we will go ahead and get the PDF out to you guys. Um, my email address is there, my office number, direct dial, and even IG, Facebook, and Clubhouse. If anybody's on Clubhouse, the new rave, um, no go problem. ahead and jump on, jump on Clubhouse and find me there. Nicole, this is Richard. Hey, Richard. So for credit unions, you're saying to have them do the wire the day before? If possible. So they should go in and have them wire the day before. Okay. If possible, because the credit unions, Richard, generally have, oh, they have a couple layers <clears throat> for some reason to um, release their wire. Hmm. I don't know what happens to my throat right then. <clears throat> <clears throat> so yeah, those are, <clears throat> we always ask, like when someone's like, oh, well, I sent it, what happened? And I asked, was it a credit union? They're like, yeah, we're like, oh, there it goes. That's, that's what happened. <laughs> All right, so we did have some questions in the chat. Anything else, Richard? I'm sorry. No, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Before my throat went crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> mm. Lorian, thank you so much for participating. Um, this always gives us an opportunity, you guys, you know, you'd be surprised. This gives us an opportunity to see what questions you all have so that we can be better partners um, with you guys in the closing process. Can you go over FERPTA once more? FERPTA, FERPTA, the acronym stands for Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act. It applies when the seller is a foreigner, hence the Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act. Um, by virtue of the fact that the seller does not have a US social security number or tax ID number. Uh, it's all for the purposes of being able to report um, the gains on the sale of real estate to the IRS. When we close, and this is why we ask for social security numbers, every time we, we do a closing um, under the IRS code, that's called a taxable event. The sale of real estate is considered a taxable event. And so at closing, unless the seller is exempt from the uh, 1099 filing, they're gonna receive a 1099 at the end of the year. That 1099 is also sent to the IRS where they can say, hey, Joe Smith sold the house for 10 million. He netted 9.5 million. So you should probably go talk to him. <laughs> um, but if it's, a foreign, if it's a foreign person, they have no way of tracking them down. And so that's what FERP did put the onus on. It's really written, oddly enough, it's a buyer's responsibility. It's the buyer's responsibility to ensure that 15% of the purchase price is uh, remitted to the IRS, but is it facilitated by the title agent. So, um, so much for that. I hope to answer the question, Dave, is that if there are any follow-up questions on that, feel free to drop them in the Yeah, chat. so you're saying it's the buyer's responsibility, but it's the seller that it that it is really the one that's paying the taxes, so, right? On their, on their, what they made. Correct, correct. It's the seller's uh, cost to pay, but it's the buyer's responsibility to ensure that they're paid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the buyer can also be, uh, so much so the buyer can be um, assessed the amount of taxes due from the seller if that if those monies are not remitted to the IRS. Hey, Cole, can I tell you back on, on, on? Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's a pretty um, pretty significant burden for the buyer to bear, so we always want to be sure on that. Um, one second, Franz. We have a question from James Homestead and Investment Property. Is it necessary for a spousal signature for investment? I know for homestead, for but for investment. <clears throat> um, first answer to your question, James. So yes, the spouse must sign if it's a finance transaction. If it is the if the title is going to be vested in the individual's name, even if it, even if they are deeming it an investment property. Remember, I mentioned for the purposes of homestead exemption, our underwriters, their position is your mind could change at any moment. So today, it's an investment property. We're closing today. And you're saying it's an investment property. Tomorrow, you can say, you know what? Forget that. I changed my mind. Never mind. It's it's my homestead. I'm gonna, it's gonna be my homestead. 
Well, now you haven't had your wife sign the mortgage. You've signed the mortgage, but your wife should have signed the mortgage as well. Now, make no mistake, there's a remedy to that. And if if you if we were we if if the lender had to go to foreclosure and foreclose on the property and name your wife, there is, and this is going down the legal path. I represented banks in foreclosure for seven years during the downturn. So this is the bonus section for you guys. There is what's called a count that they can add to the complaint to say that um, the wife did not sign the mortgage, but it's called an equitable right. We have the right to foreclose her homestead interest um, because of X, Y, Z. So again, it's a, it's, a, it's a very technical or legal issue. Um, just understand that when your title agent is saying, hey, um, the spouse needs to sign a mortgage, this is what they're getting at. Um, yes, we are located in West Palm Beach. We're actually right across from the board is our main location, but we service, we close all of Florida. We have locations um, all the way from as south, far south as Coral Gables, all the way a physical office to Port St. Lucie. And then obviously, again, we use uh, mobile notary and um, mail away to close really all over the nation. Um, absolutely, Del Rey and Boca for sure. <laughs> that was one of our first offices. <laughs> so Boca off of um, Glades is uh, one of our offices, and uh, Del Rey is not far as well. <clears throat> uh, hey, yeah, cool. No We're question. right down there. Um, and then you said, what if you already have a homestead still the same? So, oh, that's a good question. That's a different question. You should not have more than one homestead. <laughs> um but yeah still the same because you could you could then you know say well that's no longer my homestead property this is not my homestead property um the homestead property whichever property you deem to be your homestead is up to you um it's not something that's etched in stone good <clears throat> good got it got it got it. all good questions james uh france you had another question yeah um i actually have two questions now um I think it's probably two on, but um, yeah. So so uh, so when it comes to Fripta, right? Um, if if you if you're not someone that's savvy enough when it comes to Fripta, the foreign investor, I'm assuming that if you know if, and I guess you can correct my very bridge with my wording. If you don't have them pay it, then you are, I guess, as the agent or maybe the buyer will be responsible for that, right? If for somehow some way you'll have them pay for the actual taxes, then you're going to be responsible for that, right? Does that makes any sense, if you know where I'm going with that? Correct. But again, if you use a title agent, you shouldn't have that issue. But that is how the, the statute is written, that the buyer is responsible. Okay. And then the other question was, um, uh, foreign investors are considered people that live outside U.S. and Canada. Is that right or wrong? Say again? Okay, so... When you're a foreign investor, foreign investors are considered individuals that live outside the U.S. and Canada. No, it's, it, it's, considered, an indi it's considered an individual who does not have a U.S. Social Security number or tax ID number, regardless of where you live. Oh, so U.S. Social or a tax ID. Yes. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Thank you very much for that clarification. Oh, one, one more thing. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. No, oh, not a problem. All right, guys. Any other questions? Again, you have my contact information. Uh, yes. First question, is it um, title company responsibility to make sure the seller pays the taxes? Yes. Yes. The, the title agent is going to collect um, the appropriate rate. And, and here's another point, since we have a lot of questions on FERPTA, here's the other, the other um, strategy that can be accomplished. The, the seller who knows that they're subject to FERPTA can, can be proactive about making their application for their withholding certificate. So that's the second part of the process. The withholding certificate will confirm to the title agent and the seller what the what the foreign seller's tax rate is that's what this is all about 15 percent is a very high number generally they should not have to pay in fact the 15 percent but that 15 percent should be enough to cover what their ultimate tax liability is and that ultimate tax liability is confirmed by the withholding certificate 
So during the closing process, if it, especially if it's a long closing period, the seller can make an application for a withholding certificate that comes in in time for closing. And so the title agent gets that withholding certificate and it says, hey, title agent, they're only responsible. Their tax liability is 8%. Make sure that you send 8%. They can keep the rest, right? Likewise, some sellers, again, if they know they're subject to it, they can make the application for the withholding certificate before they even go on the market. They already know. I don't have a social security number tax ID. I know I'm gonna have to pay taxes. I've confirmed my tax rate is, here's your withholding certificate. Some title agents may consider holding those funds while the seller makes their application to the IRS for their withholding certificate. We have done that. I will tell you now, we don't do that anymore, <laughs> especially since COVID, it takes forever, it takes forever to get this withholding certificate. And Notwithstanding the fact that it's going to take, for, it can take forever for the IRS to, with, to issue the, the, the withholding certificate. When it does come out, they expect their money immediately as that they had responded immediately. And so for that reason, um, Title Experts does not hold uh, funds. We make sure that they're, that they're submitted. Um, and the, um, once the withholding certificate, once the seller files their taxes, that following year, then they will, you know, get it, get their funds back. Because at the end of the day, again, the, the largest liability is on the buyer if those funds are not remitted um, in a timely manner. So we just have to make sure, you know, everything is done fair. Uh, Damien, no, again, thank you so much for your great questions and attending. Like I said, every time I know myself, every time I, I teach these classes, you guys ask great questions and it, it allows us to uh, revise the um, the presentation to make sure that we get you the information that you need. Now, with that being said, I want to also say that I do sit on the uh, Professional Development Committee for RAPB. If there are any courses, I'm glad you said that, Damien. If, you, if there are any courses that you guys are not seeing that you feel like you need, please feel free to shoot me an email, raycole at titleexperts.com. Listen, we meet regularly going over the coursework that's being offered to the real estate professionals. If you're seeing something or not seeing courses that you need, or if you're seeing courses that need to be offered more or added to, feel free to let us know. That is our absolute goal is to ensure the professional development of our realtor partners is accomplished. And we would love to, um, we would love to, to, to provide that service to you. Listen, any class at all, especially now with with COVID, I mean, we can jump on and have a conversation for 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, when are you exempt from the withholding, uh, from the withholding? That's a good question, Dave. You are exempt if the purchase price is, and this is one of the exemptions, there are a few more, but the most common is if the purchase price is $300,000 or less, and the buyer is an individual, not an entity, who intends to use the property as their personal residence for at least six months, them, the, the buyer, they or their close family members intend to use the property as their personal residence for at least six months out of each upcoming two years. It's a, it's a mouthful, huh? But that's that's the that's the most common exception. And there's there's another threshold between three and a million and a million and up just goes out. So that's the most common exception where we don't even have to have a conversation about FERPTA. The buyer signs an affidavit affirming those uh that they will use it we keep it and then we never even have to have a conversation james would love to work with you sir great questions today do i i do dave <laughs> i do have a contract class um i will find out when that's going to go on the schedule i teach contracts i teach the writers class i teach this class on April 11th, I'm teaching, um, I'm under contract now what, which is the contract to closing process on the transactional side. Um, that class was written based on one of my, one of my newer realtors, but he was a heavy hitter early on. He went under contract, I think it was like $450,000 of property through the contract in the office. He said, now what? And I said, oh, I got to write a class. That's what, you don't know <laughs> what to do. So, so we're going to have, uh, we're going to have, it's called, um, the contract to close process for realtors is April 11th, same place, same time, 12 to 1.30. Check the calendar um, for registration. And, and Dave, I'll find out about the contract class. Um, if the buyer doesn't have social security number or tax, this is Damien's question. If the buyer doesn't have a social security number or tax ID, not a problem. 
it'll be a problem when they become a seller, but as a buyer, there's no issue with that. Um, that's a good question, Damien. So you're talking about the uh, now what class, right? Say again. You're talking about the now what class, right? Well, the title of the class is actually, um, hold on one second for me. Um, Mm, what did they name it? Anatomy of a transaction. It. It's called Anatomy of a Transaction. It's actually on April 15th on tax day. Hope y'all filed your taxes it's on tax day. <laughs> the board said, are we sure we're going to have this class on tax day? I said, that'll be fine. They're professional. So it's called Anatomy of a Transaction, right? Anatomy of a Transaction. So we're going to talk about you're under contract and it's, all, it's from the realtor side. Today we had the conversation about contract to close from the title agent side of the transaction. On the 15th, we're having a conversation about the, uh, the, the contract to close process from the realtor side. So we're talking about you're under contract. What are we considering with regards to the escrow deposit? What if they don't make the escrow deposit? When is the escrow deposit due? What's happening during the inspection period? What's happening during the appraisal? What happens if the property appraises and what happens if it doesn't? Um, we're talking about what if, uh, you know, what if someone dies? So all those different, we're talking about the, um, the loan approval. What if I don't get my loan approval? What conversation should I be having? And so we're going to, we're going to swing the table around at that, on that, on the next month and go contract to close from the realtor's perspective. So that's April 15th. It should be on the calendar. Um, go ahead and sign up and I will see you guys then. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Someone said, what is CH? CH is Clubhouse, Clubhouse, Clubhouse. James, that's Clubhouse. It's the new rave. <laughs> if you have an iPhone, um, I actually have a couple invites. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, unfortunately, you cannot access the application from Android. But if you have an iPhone or an iPad and you need an invite to Clubhouse, shoot me an email to raycole at titleexperts.com. I'll need your phone number and I'll send it to you. Yeah, I think I have to text it to you. But um, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Clubhouse. It is a, it's a different, it's a audio based um, social app now where there's various rooms where you can go in and you have conversations with different professionals about different topics, uh, realtors. It's been around for, oh gosh, since about, mm, I feel like it's been around since like June of 2020, but it really took off towards the end of last year. And realtors are <laughs> and it's 24 hours. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sophie said it's 24 hours. Um, realtors really jumped on the app about um, and, and about December. And now there's a ton of realtors on there. So there's realtor rooms running every day. I'm every morning. I um, uh, There's a room at 7 a.m. called Good Morning Real Estate. That is that is moderated by a South Florida agent, um, Mr. Jermaine out of South Florida uh, at eight o'clock. Every morning we have our numbers and attentions and gratitudes. I co-moderate that room um, with another real estate professional out of Tampa and actually all over the, the country where a bunch of realtors jump on. It's an accountability call. We jump on, what are your numbers for the day? What are your intentions for the day? And what is your gratitude for the day? It's called the morning power up. And then throughout the day, um, there's different rooms on marketing, lead gen. Yesterday, there was a room on finding um, off-market leads in the luxury market. Um, I co-moderated moderate, that room with Holly from the Lucas Group up in Jupiter, um, and it's, it's just amazing. You get to meet a lot of people um, in a concentrated area. I thought I was the only realtor on the planet, not a clubhouse. And no, you're not the only one, but you may be one of two. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but like Sophie said, it's a lot of information. You, you get on there, you'll meet a lot of friends, you'll get a lot of information, just... Uh, just um, be sure to implement. So, so that's that. Um, again, like I said, if anyone wants to jump on, I have a couple, I have a couple, <laughs> Damien said he's clueless. I have a couple invites. I do have a room. I have a club on Clubhouse called the Agent CEO Accelerator Club. If you guys follow me on social media, you'll probably see that I have, I curate a club called Agent CEO Accelerator. 
it's for the purposes of mentoring and coaching realtors to act like an agent, but think like a CEO, running your real estate businesses like a CEO, um, to implement systems to create leverage, reduce chaos, um, and just really run it like a business. And you run your business and not have your business run you. So that's all things I'm doing all day when I'm not on here teaching you guys. So with one minute left, any other questions? <laughs> I don't have a countdown. So actually I do. In five, four, three, two, one, it's one thirty. If there's no, you too, Damon, you guys have a great day. Get at it. Um, it's a crazy market, but it's a good market. So today's class was good. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. And I'll see you guys next month on the 15th on tax day. You're welcome, Sophie. See you on Clubhouse. <laughs> see y'all later.